the material I'm talking about today is kind of a continuation of what we talked about um, um, on Tuesday. And uh, so these are, are more with spatial and spatiotemporal models. Um, I think where we left off is largely, um, uh, you know, I we talked about these models um, that can generally be described as spatial regression models. And so the spatial regression model is just including a vector of, of coefficients, some matrix of predictors X um, and residual error E, which makes it exactly the same as regular linear regression. Um, but it has the spatial term uh, phi, um, and I introduced that in the context of these car type models where we might have, um, you know, neighboring, um, you know, neighboring states that might be, uh, you know, affecting one another or, or have correlated dynamics. Um, and we would build these, these adjacency matrices. Another way to, to estimate these, these fees with a Gaussian, predict, Gaussian process type model where we have um, some large number of, of, of uh, random effects we're trying to estimate. Um, and I think uh, in thinking about Eli's um, lecture on Tuesday or the, the, you know, the short material she was talking about um, with, uh, with uh, you know, um, autocorrelated errors, I think it's important to think about whether or not this, this kind of model constitutes um, you know, a state space model. And I think um, that's a, it's a huge can of worms. I don't think that there's necessarily a right answer to this, but I think a lot of folks um, would see this, um, could see this either way and have argued for this um, being, this kind of model being either a state space model or not. And I think on one hand, um, you know, the, this model could be seen as a state space model because this, uh, depending on how this vector phi is modeled, um, this could be a stochastic process in space and it represents kind of an underlying or hidden um, uh, spatial surface that we're not able to measure directly, but we're, we're corrupting that through the presence of this, this observation error, or observation noise. Um, on the downside, this, you know, the, just including random effects, this could be also seen as kind of a mixed effects model, which some people don't see as a state space model. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, the, the, the fee would just be, um, you know, the, this, this mixed effect that wouldn't necessarily describe like, a, you know, it's not describing a latent random walk, for example, that we would see with like a DFA or, a, um, you know, a Mars type model where we had some hidden population state that was changing through time. So, so I think in general, the state, state space um, um, uh, terminology is kind of a, a loaded term for these kinds of models, um, but it's just something to think about as we're, as we're describing them. Um, okay, so um, I was going to talk about um, one or two different different extensions of, of this uh, this kind of model that we talked about, starting with the car models. Um, and instead of you know, if we if we think about that that fee, there's a number of ways to estimate it in a in a way that's constrained that minimizes the number of parameters that we're trying to estimate. So, in in one sense, um, you know, in the car model. We were really only estimating um, this this matrix rho, which was controlling uh, essentially our, our neighbor neighbor weights and uh, and a variance parameter. So it was only estimating two parameters, um, and you can fit a car model with you know of the entire United States, and it's it's very uh, it has a very small number. Um, the same sense, we can think about you know if instead we wanted to estimate a vector of phi. Um, representing a random effect for each of those 48 states, we could do that in, in a Gaussian process model. And remember the Gaussian process is gonna model the, it's not gonna model the, the mean, but it's gonna model the covariance between points. And so if we have 48 points, um, you know, we can measure the distance between them and adopt some kernel like a Gaussian or exponential um, covariance function. And then model, model correlation or covariance as a function of distance. Um, with a, with a few number of parameters to, to estimate a giant matrix. So um, that, that, works, that works well. Um, the challenge is that Gaussian process models are known to be um, typically slow when we have a large, large dimension, just because um, the multivariate normal um, function, especially if we're doing this estimation in, in say a Bayesian, uh, Bayesian sense, we have to generally invert that matrix a large number of times. And that process is just, um, just tends to be pretty time consuming. So, um, so an alternative to doing the full Gaussian process model is what's known as this Gaussian predictive process model. And so the Gaussian predictive process model takes our, you know, if we have a vector of, of 48, uh, 48 values of phi that we're treating as random effects, 
instead of estimating 48 random effects uh, and a covariance matrix that's that's 48 by 48, instead what we can do is estimate, um, you know, we can pick say um, six or 10 random locations within the United States, um, and they may may or may not fall on you know on state boundaries doesn't really matter, um, but we pick a random set of locations that don't represent necessarily states. Um, we estimate the random effects at that smaller number of locations, and so instead of estimating a vector of say 48. We're estimating six or ten, and then we can, um, you know, if we if we assign those points randomly, we can still estimate the distance between each of those points and say each of the centers of the states that we're trying to estimate the the random effects fee for, and we can use those that knowledge of distances between those, you know, what I'm calling these um, the the points that correspond to phi star. We can we can take those distances and project our estimated phi star values to uh, to the centers of each state. So so we can recover this phi as a function of phi star and the distances from those those randomly picked um, small number of points to the the centers of each state. And so when we do that, that's called this Gaussian predictive process model. It tends to create um, you know as we're doing this this spatial interpolation. It tends to create fairly smooth spatial fields, um, and again, it's really only dependent on on um, you know the the vector phi star, or you know we choose how many of these uh, smaller number of values, which are, are called knots. So we we choose the number of knots or dimension of that, and we choose some covariance function. Um, but beyond that, it's you know it's a very flexible approach. Um, and these types of models can be done either in a maximum likelihood or a Bayesian framework. Um, there's a, a great paper, it's one of my favorites, uh, describing this, this kind of material by Latimer, um, which I link to here. And I think that this is, uh, this is in Ecology Letters, but it's a really good, easy read um, and will, will be a good intro for, for people who are interested in applying these, these tools. Um, okay, so two kinds of, uh, or a couple kinds of packages that, that I wanted to talk about was uh, was first, um, you know, there's a, an R package that a postdoc, a former postdoc of mine, was um, was working on for his project. Um, it's called uh, Glim Fields, and so this is this is on CRAN. Um, and uh, Glim Fields is is a is a really cool package because it uses um, it uses uh, Stan as a backend to do the Bayesian estimation of these Gaussian predictive process type models. Um, it's got a you know the standard uh, formula syntax that everybody's familiar with. Um, and it allows um, our spatial field to be to be pretty flexible. So, in addition to modeling those, you know, if we're having a vector phi that represents, say, the deviations of each state, we can model those as kind of normally distributed um, deviations. If we wanted to model, um, uh, you know, say say snowfall or something like that. Um, but if we thought that there were extreme values um, in in snow or some some environmental variable, we could use instead of modeling them as multivariate normal. We could use a multivariate t distribution to, to try to better capture those extreme values, and so um, so the Glim Fields package is uh, allows you to do that uh, very very efficiently. Um, the multivariate t is certainly supported for some applications, um, but you tend to you tend to need a lot of data, um, and the package is also flexible in that instead of just having a normal response, we can have any number of families. Um, that include positive, uh, you know, strictly positive, or just count observations, count count response um, families like a you know Poisson or negative binomial or that kind of distribution. Okay, so um, you know I'm just I'm not going to actually show results, but I, I just wanted to show the syntax. It's very simple. Um, you know I think uh, in in the simplest possible case we could estimate estimate um, you know a version of the spatial model where we have a single spatial field. That's shared across all time slices, and so in this case, um, you know we have to we specify uh, time as just a null uh, parameter, and um, the other part of this that we have to specify is the the dimensionality of that phi star, so the number of of what we're calling knots here. Um, so in this case, um, you know the the example here would be to the the snow tell data that I talked about for Washington State on Tuesday. There's 70 some odd stations. Um, you know, in, in practice, we'd probably want to estimate a model with, say, you know, uh, 25 knots or something like that. Um, but uh, so six knots is probably too few, but this is how we specify it. And then we just give our, 
um, you know, the vector, the, the names in the data frame of our latitude and longitude covariates. So fairly straightforward. Um, so moving, uh, you know, the next, the next kind of complicated model we could fit would be a model where, uh, where we fit a separate spatial field to each year. And so in this case, um, you know, instead of having time as, as a null argument, we can specify the, you know, the name in, of the, in the data frame that includes um, the kind of the, our time, time attribute or time variable. And then, um, then the, last, the last argument, once we start including spatial fields um, that are independent by year, we can choose to model those either as, um, as separate by each year, so they're totally independent, or we can choose to model them as, as an autoregressive process. And so in the autoregressive process, um, remember we're gonna be estimating this extra uh, fee parameter and that fee will, will just determine um, you know, whether, whether hotspots one year tend to be hotspots the next. And so in this, in this simple example, we would just estimate the, the estimate, uh, not choose to estimate them by setting that to false. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, we can turn on and off the, um, the arguments for this multivariate T distribution very easily um, just by changing this argument uh, for estimate, uh, estimate underscore DF, which is uh, essentially our, uh, our new parameter in a student T distribution. So that controls, um, you know, whether or not, uh, whether or not we're estimating it. When we don't estimate it, um, you know, uh, when, when, when new has values of say 30 or greater, we get behavior from the T distribution that's very similar to a normal distribution. So, um, so um, it's a very flexible approach um, and uh, you know, you're welcome to play with it on your own time. I think these, the downside that we found with these models is that when the dimensionality of the spatial surface is very high. So if you have, if you have a spatial field that has um, hundreds of points per time step, um, and you want to estimate even a Gaussian process model, Gaussian predictive process model with say 40 or 50 knots. Um, this kind of model would probably take overnight to run. So it's it tends to be tends to be pretty slow, um, just because of the kind of the inefficient sampling associated with with these models. So um, so there's there's kind of this need for um, you know faster computation or, or or slightly different models, and that's what we'll talk about uh, talk about next. Um, so the kind of the last, um, well, the last family of, of models that I'm, I'm talking about um, are these, uh, these models that are based on INLA. And so INLA is called um, uh, the integrated nested Laplace approximation. And um, this is an approach that is kind of based on the same idea as the Gaussian predictive process models where we are going to be estimating um, a very complex spatial surface from a smaller number of points and then projecting from our, our kind of um, underlying number of, of knots to those to, to our actual observations. Um, so the benefits of, of using INLA are that um, we can have very large dimensional problems. So hundreds or thousands of points per time step. Um, and uh, the second kind of the reason that INLA works so well compared to the Gaussian predictive process model is that INLA really takes advantage of the math um, that uses um, these sparse covariance matrices. So if you have if you have thousands of points, you could imagine um, creating covariance matrix that describes the relationship between those thousand points. But um, for a lot of cases, uh, points that are far apart are going to have zero correlation. And so um, instead of trying to even estimate that as a as a as a parameter or as a function of of distance between those points. Um, the sparse covariance approach basically models those 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 um, those elements as zero, um, and there's a lot of a lot of math that we can we can use to kind of speed up all of the um, all the estimation. Um, okay, I don't need to get into the motivation here. Um, the overall the overall um, difference is that um, the compared to the Gaussian predictive process model, um, this this approach with INLA can be can be much much quicker. We can do this either in a Bayesian or a maximum likelihood setting. Um, uh, and uh, there's kind of optimization routines built into INLA to, to kind of do this for you. So that's, um, that's useful. Um, one of the challenges of using these, these kinds of models like, like that, that are based on INLA are uh, we have to create what's called this mesh. And so the mesh is, uh, I think it's on the, my next slide here. Oh, sorry. Um, so 
um, so the inla the inla mesh are these kind of um, you know the four the four figures here represent four different alternative meshes that we, we could create based on this to, to try to fit a model to the snow tall data. So the red points are our actual data and the, the gray line represents this, this lattice or this mesh of triangles. Um, and there are, there's, um, there's definitely some, some rules and guidelines for, uh, for generating good, good meshes in terms of how far apart we want each of the points to be relative to the, the vertices of these uh, uh, of the, the triangles where they interse intersect, for example, or um, how dense the mesh should be relative to the points, et cetera. Um, there's a tool and there's a tool that's, that's really useful called Mesh Builder that you can use to, to kind of explore these. It's interactive, I think via Shiny and we'll let you kind of uh, explore these meshes on your own. But um, this is really more of the art of, of uh, fitting these spatiotemporal mar models. Um, because you can get, um, you know, you can fit, fit mo good models using very different meshes that will give you slightly different answers. Um, and there's no real, um, or the, I would say the guidelines for, um, for which mesh to use in which situation are not fully, uh, have not fully been established. So I think it's, it's um, uh, uh, you know, in some part it's, it's kind of the interpretation. Um, so the, you know, the, the questions when we're using these meshes are, are things like, um, you know, how many of our how many of our actual observation locations are falling on the vertices between these different triangles, or if we're putting a border around uh, around our our main mesh, uh, you know, is that border area large enough? Um, and all these choices have some impact on on our ultimate estimates. Um, so by default, Inla does um, estimation via maximum likelihood, and so um, you know, with our snow tell data. Um, this is, I'm not going to actually, uh, I don't have the, um, the call to run in the here, but um, this is just what the output looks like. And it's very familiar because it's, it's exactly the same as what you might get with, uh, with using, um, you know, LM or GLM. Um, Inla is also very flexible in that we can include splines like a GAM or include time varying effects like, like a dynamic linear model would have a time varying coefficient. Um, so these models are very flexible. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of examples in their in their um, help manuals. Um, so once we fit a model with Inla, we can then uh, we can then project the estimates uh, to some spatial surface, and it can be the spatial surface um, you know in our original data set, or it can be a, a new one. Um, and we can do do these kinds of predictions by year. So this would represent for our snow tell data what those predictions look, might look like for for each uh, each year of the time series. Uh, in this case, they're all very, very similar. <clears throat> um, and I think um, the, you know, the the only potential or one of the only potential downsides of Inla is that uh, because we're doing this estimation in um, uh, in a maximum likelihood setting, it can be it can be slow sometimes. Um, to speed up the estimation, some folks have developed a uh, an extension of, of Inla that will work with um, what these automatic automatic differentiation routines in Template Model Builder, which is a, another uh, TMB is another R package that's written in C++. And so, um, you know, there's there's a couple different packages to, to um, that will integrate Inla with with R. The first is um, is Vast, and so Vast has been really uh, developed by Jim Thorson. Uh, it's really used for a lot of fisheries applications and is a super powerful, uh, powerful tool. Um, the other is this, um, this SDM TMB package. And um, this is the one that we'll, we'll be talking about today. Um, but we, you know, to, to fit kind of a, a model using Inla with, with TMB to our snow data, you know, the first step is really to, to make this mesh. And so um, we can use this make mesh function this is sort of what it looks like, where our, you know, again, our red points are, are or the the points are the locations. Um, and um, actually, it's funny. Um, I'm I'm not actually sure what I need to go back and look at what's being shown with the the actual open circles here um, because I'm confusing myself. But um, this is essentially what the what the mesh would look like. This is not ideal because um, in a you know in a in a perfect world we might want triangles that are more equally spaced. In areas here where the points and the triangles are denser, we're going to get um, we're going to get better and more precise predictions than um, than some of these locations on the east side where where points are points or stations are 
isolated from one another by, by large distances. Um, so then we can we can use this this framework and this this package SDMTMB to fit different kinds of models. Um, in this case, we could fit a model um, without passing in a, a, an argument that labels our our time slices. And so in, so in this case, we would just fit a model with a single spatial field that would be shared across years, um, and this would only have an intercept. And so it would also assume that um, that snowfall would be the same in each year if we wanted to include. Um, year is a factor, for example, to let years have different mean snowfall rates, uh, we could, we could uh, do that as well. Um, we could also then fit a model, so this would be fitting a model where we have a spatial field that is independent by year, and in this case, we just specify our, our time argument, um, um, which describes, you know, is basically labeling um, the observations to each, each, uh, each time step. So, um, so it's very flexible, uh, very easy to use with the, the same uh, same um, formula syntax that folks are familiar with. And then from these these types of of models, we can generate um, you know plots of residuals, um, which are kind of the basic the basic things that we can use for diagnostics. Um, in this case, uh, you know it seems like uh, you know if we put a, a reference line on here, um, the QQ plot would not look great, um, and, but probably not surprising given the simpl simplicity of the model. But um, this is flexible and can be used for um, a number of different distributions. So it's useful for, uh, for data that's also binary or uh, Poisson distributed, et cetera. Um, so in looking at the residuals, we also want to look at how whether, there, whether or not there's a trend in residuals over time. Um, in this case, it seems like there are, um, you know, there's certainly some, um, um, maybe some years where residuals are higher or lower than, than average or higher or lower than zero. Um, this could potentially be solved, for example, by putting some, um, some, um, something other than just a single intercept in the model to allow every year to have a slightly different mean. And this could be done with like a, you know, you could put a, a smoother, like, like in a GAM or, um, or random effects or, um, or fixed effects uh, or factors, like I was, I was saying earlier. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's essentially all we're gonna, gonna talk about. Um, there's a bunch of good references if you want to get into Inla. I think that you know the Inla book is really great, um, and some other good references here too. 